It's not just a game, it's not just a grass. Lawn Solutions Australia is the exclusive home of Australia's best sports turf varieties. For the world's best grasses like Tiff Tough Hybrid Bermuda and Sir Grange Zoysia, contact Lawn Solutions Australia at lawnsolutionsaustralia.com.au. Hello and welcome to episode 101 of The Thing About Golf, the podcast from Golf Australia magazine, trying to answer that eternal question, what is it that draws so many to this game? My name's Rod Moran. I'm joined on the digital blower today by my colleague in this audio adventure, John Huggan. Huggy will be at the wheel for the next couple of weeks in the run-up to the Ryder Cup with a number of special guests, starting with this week's subject, 2010 US Open winner Graham McDowell. Huggy, welcome. You told me when you sent this interview through, and this is rare for you, you said you thought it was good. Why? Yeah. Well, Graham can talk. <laughs> I think you'd be the first to admit. And you can listen. So that's a good combination. <laughs> yes, indeed. My goodness, he can talk. I mean, it's no um, surprise that I think it was a few years ago now, but he won the uh, award from the American golf writers for the most cooperative <laughs> player. Um, and he's he's a terrific. I've always liked him a lot. He's uh, I played with him. Actually, I'm at Wentworth uh, this week for the BMW PGA. Um and I played with Graham in the Pro-Am at, here at Wentworth in 2010, just three weeks before he won the US Open. So obviously, playing with me had a, a big influence. So. I didn't know that. There you go. Yeah. I'm sure you've never let him forget it either. Can you well, Just quickly on a rabbit hole, surely he can't talk more than Harrington. That can't be possible. He, it's, I tell you what, it's close. <laughs> neck it would, neck. If you had the two of them together in the same room, I don't think you'd need anybody else there, that's for sure. One ear, one ear for each. He's an interesting player, isn't he? He's not the quintessential modern-day touring professional. He's not. I mean, uh, his swing is, is – well, he's one of those guys that you can tell from a distance who it is. Uh, it's a swing all his own. Um, I think he's always struggled with it a bit. Um Technique wise, but when he's on or when he's been on in the past, I mean, my goodness, he's been good. Um, and he's done some great things. I mean, apart from the US Open win, I mean, he hold the winning part in the Ryder Cup, he's uh, you know, and won umpteen tournaments all over the place. So, mm-hmm. and he was a college star, but everybody forgets from nowhere, really. I mean, he, I think he mentions it in the in the podcast that he went to America as just a kind of run of the mill, played for Ireland as an amateur kind of guy, and um, one of many that you know that sort of level, but as soon as he got there, he just took off. Yeah. He was like number one college player in America for the, certainly some of the time he was, I think it was Alabama. Yes, that sounds that sounds about right. Long way from Northern Ireland to Alabama, you would think too. Yeah. There's a whole podcast episode in that at some point, I reckon. What happens that you get to a certain level, some go on and some don't, and it's not always the ones you'd pick. McDowell strikes me as one of those types who's incredibly affable, but in competitive terms, will put a knife in you on the first tee just for the sport of it. Yeah, yeah, he's. Um, you're right. I mean, he sounds like the nicest guy on the planet, and he's even, you know, despite the fact that uh, the time in America has done, you know, irreparable damage to his accent, which is all over the place, as he freely admits himself. But yes, um, he's a bit of a killer. Yeah, he, it's a, on his record there. If you look at the guys that he beat down the stretch, it's a like a who's who. Um, when when he was on, he was really on, and uh, he's obviously he's he's from that level. Um, we talked a bit about that. Um, that was one of the reasons I think he joined the the live golf side of things. Um, we get into that a little bit. Um, he was one of the guys. We, I think we mentioned this um, the press conference at the very first live event at mm-hmm. uh, Centurion Club in, near London. He was in the press conference. He got himself into all kinds of trouble <laughs> trying to be nice yes. and answer the questions. Yeah. And he got himself into a terrible mess, um, which he's, he was getting into areas he, he really didn't know enough about to, to be answering, which is true of all of us, uh, not just him, but um, very honest with it. Um, you, you can't help but like the guy. I mean, he's just, you know, He's just the sort of guy you'd love to sit down and have a pint with. Yeah, indeed, which you got to do. Last thing, Huggy, of course, this next series of interviews is going to be Ryder Cup focused because the Ryder Cup is coming up. And I don't care where you are in the world, Ryder Cup is one of yeah. the great golf fans. There's nobody who's uninterested in it. You pick a side, no matter where you're from, and you go for it. I was really interested to hear him say, and it's the snippet I used to promote this this podcast last week, that team events have been so much more important, even than winning the US Open at Pebble Beach. That's an extraordinary attitude, isn't it? 
I thought that too. Um, but it's right. I mean, the the Ryder Cup has done a lot to a lot of careers, not just Graham's, to elevate them to a level where they probably wouldn't have been otherwise. You know, there, there's a whole bunch of names you could come up with. Sam Torrance being the classic example over here, who's someone who is who's synonymous with the Ryder Cup, but didn't actually break through at major level. Um, so there's a few guys like that, and, and Graham's certainly one of them. But you're right. I mean, this is a guy who, I think I said that, I, I was shocked. I yes. think you're, you're a guy who won the US Open at Pebble Beach, for yes. goodness sake. <laughs> Jack Nicholas put that pretty high on the list. That's more true of the European Ryder Cup players than the US ones, I think, Huggy, that that elevation yes. of play yeah. in it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's always meant more, hasn't it? I mean, the the underdog mentality, the, they were playing for the tour yeah. more than themselves. And the Americans, until fairly recently, certainly were playing for themselves, not the tour. Yeah, this this upcoming Ryder Cup will be fascinating. I'm sure we'll talk about it as it gets closer. But for the moment, thank you, Huggy. Let's have a listen to Graham McDowell. I appreciate you taking the time today. My pleasure. Okay, uh, welcome to the latest edition of the Thing About Golf podcast. Uh, my latest guest is uh, a man who's won a major championship. He's won the winning point in a Ryder Cup. He's beaten Tiger Woods in a playoff for a tournament. But amidst all that, Graham McDowell, what was and is the thing about golf for you? Hmm. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, the thing about golf, I mean, I think it's just a quest for perfection in a game which is imperfectible. Um, you know, I think I've always loved the solace of you and you and the improvement you know i just stand on the range the same way i stood on the range when i was 12 years old you know trying to find it trying to get better i I think it's uh it's a beautiful nasty delicious (laughs) difficult game you know and you know it's uh you know it's kind of like a microscopic view of life you know it's got its ups and downs every day and uh you know you got to you got to wrestle with your emotions and you know the physical side of the game, but you know most importantly the mental side of the game. So it's it's definitely a game which I uh, I still love to this day. You can come up with a few different adjectives for it, can't you? You just there's did. definitely a lot of four letter words to describe the game. You know, there's no doubt. You know, it's I think the the, the fact that golf's a four letter word I think is pretty ironic. You know, it's uh, it definitely. Uh, emotes a few of those every now and again. Yeah, and have things that what you just described there has that changed? Over the years for you and, you know, in terms of what you're thinking over the ball? I think, um, I think it's always been the same. I think it's, uh, you know, I, I've gone down the rabbit hole a few times trying to come up with a new way to do it. I think uh, I've realized about myself that, you know, there only is one way that I can do it. I, I've always had the same swing habits. I've always had the same mental bad habits. You know, I think... Um, you know, a leopard doesn't change its spots very much. You know, I, I don't think of too many world-class pro players that have been able to reinvent themselves. Mm. You know, I look at a guy like Rory. Rory's been the same golfer since he was 15. Yeah. You know, he's always been fast and he's always swung it great. He's always had an unbelievable short game. He looks a bit different now, mm. but he's still the same guy. Yeah, he's not the chubby wee kid he was before. Yeah, you know, he was definitely, <laughs> you know, he, he's obviously a, a fit lad now. And uh, but he was always fast and he was always yeah. impressive and not many guys like Tiger who've gone through swing changes the way he has. But uh, I look at most most tour players, best you know, world class players that I know, they are who they are. Mm. They swing their swing, you know that old cliche. But I mean, you know, like I say, you you can't you can't change who you are. And and you know, twenty one, twenty two years into my playing career, you know, I've tried to change who I am a little bit, but. As I, I feel like in my forties and you know, the last couple of years, I'm I'm starting to try and embrace a little bit more who I used to be and who I am, and yeah. and and just try to make that as good as it can be every day. Now, talk to me a little bit about your your swing. You're one of the things I like about you, which there are many. Um, I can tell it's you from a distance. There's nobody else looks like you, you swing wise. I feel like I feel like yeah. you could say that about so many players. Well, you know, I think not you, so much these days. Right, yeah, you know, uh, the modern way. That's it, true. You know, that that's fair. I mean, I mm-hmm. think. Uh, Maybe talking about the guys that I've grown up playing with the yeah, last twenty generation. years. Yeah, yeah, my generation of player, you can recognize Ian Poulter from yeah, two miles away and Westwood and you know, Garcia and you know, it's you know, there's no doubt idiosyncratic moves. Like you say, the modern modern day golf swing I wouldn't call it one dimensional, but it's uh it, it's definitely a, a slightly different looking technique. It's long yeah. and it's powerful and uh 
it's it's certainly um, the young breed coming through 185, 190 ball speed plus. I mean, it's uh, it's definitely an era. It's going to be interesting. I'm, I'm excited to see where golf goes in the next 20 years. My my previous 20 years, the game has evolved a huge amount, mm. but I feel like uh, we're coming into a new into a new way of playing the sport where you know obviously driving the ball is premium. Um, you know, the bit in the middle is obviously still pretty important and you got to get it in the hole. Yeah. But, uh, you know, obviously the, the, the power game is, is really something that's, uh, you know, taken over the sport a little bit. People who are listening to this will be not surprised to hear me say, ask this question. Now, is that necessarily a good thing at your level? I mean, there should be an advantage for if I can hit it 20 yards past you, but yeah. the, the, the advantage now seems to be so overwhelming that it's, taken away from the rest of the game a little bit, I think. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it just bothers me that the best courses in the world start to become a little, you know, when I think of St. Andrews, I think of the road <clears throat> hole. You know, when they put that new tee by in, in yeah. there at the road yeah. hole, I was yeah. a bit like, yeah. where, where are we going here? Well, what's happening? Yeah. You know, it's like the integrity of the best golf courses in the world. Mm. You know, you're starting to, you know, but to me, St. Andrews is not about length. It's about the wind and the weather, and yeah. the pins. And, yeah. you know, you can, you know, it's one of my favorite golf courses on the planet. But I, I hate to see these new tees going in. You know, I hate playing open championship courses when you just know that the, the, the rooting of the golf course wasn't supposed to be like that. Yeah. You weren't supposed to walk well, off the a green. The strategy's getting lost. You, were, you weren't supposed to walk off a green and have to hike 200 yards well, back to a new tee box, which is back halfway yeah. down the last hole you just played. You yeah. know, I mean, Funny stuff. you should mention that. I did that just to, for fun on a Sunday two or three years ago, just to see how far I would have to walk to go nowhere. Yeah. It was well over 2,000 yards. 2,000 yards yeah. back to tee boxes. And back, and to, back, and back yeah. to, where, to where I was already. Yeah, you know? and, I, and it really takes away from the, the flow, the way these golf courses yeah. were designed to be mm-hmm. to be played in the beginning. But, you know, going back to the to, to the power game, um, you know, the ball roll back and all this stuff, you know. I mean, there's obviously a lot of reasons why the ball's going so far now. I mean, obviously it's coaching, it's technology, it's, it's launch monitors, it's the understanding of how to propel the ball most – efficiently it's the way kids are getting coached nowadays you know it's not like when i was a kid it was like you know get it in the fairway and yeah you know we'll talk about maybe hitting it far after that now it's hit it as hard as you can and, and we'll figure out the straight part and you know it's you know i've got a six-year-old boy who likes playing golf and i'm 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 telling him to hit it as hard as he can because you can learn the speed now at, at a young age you can't pick the speed up in your 30s because i've tried and it's hard to do yeah. you you learn that when you're young and and uh but um like i say the, the only thing that worries me is just the integrity of these great golf courses and having to the other ha, ha, having to you know build these new tee boxes and and obviously modern architecture and seventy five hundred eight thousand yard golf courses you know so I mean aside from that I mean I think the power is you know that that that's it's a talent it's it's you know mm-hmm. to, to watch these boys drive the drive the ball the way they do uh, it's it's amazing you know and I think. It's taken a, the sport into a new level of, of athleticism, and I think you know we need a little bit of that in our sport. You know, it's uh, it is a skill game at the end of the day, but I um, mean, obviously, it's power and skill match now. It's uh, it's it's definitely going to be interesting to see the evolution in the next twenty years. It, it does bother me a little bit, and again, people on this listen to these podcasts will have heard me say this before, but uh, the driving in my in my time of playing golf has gone from being the, the hardest thing to do. And sitting at your level is one of the easiest things. And the, the average driver on your tour is so much closer to the best driver now. I mean, Rory, I don't, I would argue, doesn't get the advantage that he should get from being the best driver. Yeah. And it used to be that Greg Norman, Nick Price, Ian Woosnam, mm-hmm. they separated themselves by being great drivers. Yeah. It's hard to do that now. For sure. I mean, I feel like I grew up in the era where the long boy, the long guys were crooked, you know, back in yeah. the early 2000s when I first turned pro. Long long talented drivers of the ball always could also be quite crooked off the tee yeah. to you know nowadays the long guys are incredibly straight you know and that's obviously the technology and the yeah. forgiveness and yeah. the cgs and understanding the physics of, of exactly what makes a driver go straight and and the coaching and launch monitors and like i said the efficiency of these ball flights and the fact that golf ball doesn't spin very much anymore you know so nowadays the best drivers of the ball in the world it is their best club in their back mm-hmm. you know when they lean on it heavily you know think about rory at firestone there six seven years ago when he won i mean he just blew i mean the way he drove the ball was mm-hmm. just obscene you know and i mean when he when these guys that are 
phenomenal off the tee when they have big driving weeks on certain golf courses they can just absolutely you know they're they're three shots ahead of a guy like me before they start augusta to a certain extent Mm -hmm. you know it was always a golf course for me where i felt like you know i'm too i'm too back every day standing on the first tee of bubba and these guys that can drive it you know can can dominate that golf course a bit i was actually going to bring that up um (laughs) I was looking at your record. Yeah, my um, my, my, my Augusta record's not uh, not not particularly it, stellar. It's not much better than mine, Graham. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a reason for that? I mean, uh, I think a little bit. Just the uh, distance. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of a distance thing, and I think it's also a little bit of a. The golf course used to scare me a little bit, you know. Iron play, I would say, would be one of my strengths. Iron play and putting, and uh, those are two things that I never did well at Augusta. And and I feel like the iron play was down to standing in fairways and having a spot on the green that I felt like I had to pitch this iron in mm-hmm. with the correct shape. And if I didn't hit that, I felt like I was going to make bogey or worse. Yeah. So I didn't. I never played the course loose. I never played it free, you know. And I feel like. Augusta is a horses for courses place yeah. because I feel like the best guys who play well there know, know where to miss it, mm. you know, because golf is a game of misses. Yeah. And I felt like I went to Augusta and I never really let myself ever miss a shot. I'm not, you know, I, 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 I felt so tight over every shot because I felt like I couldn't miss it. And that, that's obviously incorrect because, you know, there are slopes and hollows and chips that you can leave yourself and putts you can leave yourself there absolutely fine. You can use the slopes. And I just never felt comfortable at Augusta. See, I'm surprised to hear that. I mean, given where you grew up, I mean, one of the world's best golf courses, mm-hmm. you you played it every day, presumably. I mean, you should have been, in, in, at least on paper, more comfortable yeah. on places like that. I know. And it's weird. Augusta yeah. is my favourite course in the world. And, you know, for absolutely no reason, because it doesn't love me back. And uh, like I said, it always was a golf course that stressed me out. You know, I, I never felt good out there. I never felt comfortable. And I never putted well. You know, and, and again, yeah, that's, you know, it's burning you know, money there. Absolutely. So yeah. it's it's like you know, my strengths, my iron play, and my putting were two strengths that I'm not going to say they became weaknesses, but I, 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 they, they, they were negated when I went to Augusta because I just didn't yeah. feel comfortable yeah. about where I could miss the ball. You know, so uh, obviously one of my, my my regrets in my career was I didn't do better at Augusta. I mean, the other three majors, you know, I had runs in them, yeah. um, did okay in them, but Augusta. Like I say, my favorite track on earth, and I'll, I'll go back there and drink a few beers, hopefully one day, and, yeah. and have a bit of crack, and, and mm-hmm. probably scratch my head and wonder why I didn't do better. But yeah. Uh, yeah. well, t- talk to me. We, we touched on it there. Um, growing up at Port Rush, I mean, it must have been. Did you appreciate it at the time? You I mean, kids never do, you know. I, mean, I, I grew up in East Lothian, which is yeah. you know great courses everywhere. It was only when I came back as an adult, having been away, that I thought, oh, man. How lucky was I to grow up here? Yeah, yeah. I think I appreciated it when I was when I was young. Well, um, you know, Port Rush has the the thirty six holes plus a nine hole par three. Yeah. So I mean, you know, nine ten years old, we were on the par three, and then we graduated onto the Valley Course, yeah. which was a great little track. Yeah. Oh, and I think it only had thirteen bunkers on the whole golf course, right. which was unusual. But uh, you know, the Dunluce, the Championship Course, was the Augusta sort of for me when I was a kid, you know, and I remember sneaking out there summer evenings with my dad, you know, we weren't Mm -hmm. really sort of old enough or good enough to be allowed out there, but it was like literally, it was literally like Augusta, you know, this, the hollow turf Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and then, you know, eventually you played it so much where you took it a bit for granted. I I was always proud of Port Rush. I was always proud of where I grew up and I was very lucky to have something like that on my doorstep facilities, cheap, uh, affordable, approachable, you know, great juniors or a really great junior section with a bunch of kids that, you know, we, you know, we grew up playing with. And, uh, you know, like I say, probably took the facilities a bit for granted eventually. And then, you know, fast forward to the 19 open, um, going back there, obviously, you know, playing the open championship at Port Rush since the first, you know, first time since 53 or whatever that date was, but, um, 51, 51. Yeah. You know, and Max Faulkner and, and guy, you know, best players in the world coming up to me and saying, this is the best links course I've ever seen. And I'm, I'm like, really? Is it that good? I mean, I, I, I know it's good. Yeah, is is yeah. it really the best you've ever seen? Yeah. So, I mean, that was sort of like a little bit of a, you know, eureka moment going, well, maybe, you know, mm-hmm. maybe this is special. And it, well, it was obviously a special weekend and watching Shane win. It was, uh, you know, it, it, it was it was a pretty phenomenal uh, Sunday afternoon and, and and like I say you know prior to where I grew up and obviously very fortunate that the game of golf became available to me and my dad took it up late in life and 
probably didn't have two pennies to rub together, but thankfully the game of golf was affordable and mm -hmm. he fell in love with it. And we sort of, by osmosis, fell in love with it as well. And, and uh, certainly... Given, it's given me a lot and, you know, certainly proud of what I've accomplished in the game. And, and like I say, you know, we said at the start, still, still love it a lot. It's, it's a game that I'll, that, that never gets old for me. Mm -hmm. You were a bit of a prodigy though, weren't you? I mean, you were, you know, when did it become clear that there was some, you know, a bit of a special talent there? Yeah, I'm not sure. Prodigy would have been sort of the word I'd have used. You know, I certainly, <laughs> I, I feel like I was just maybe just behind the prodigies, you know, the mm -hmm. David, David Jones, who, Actually, carries for Lydia Co. Now, he was probably the best young player in Ireland when really? I was. Wow. You know, him and I came up together, and then Ricky Elliott, who obviously carries for Brooks. Now, yeah. he was mm -hmm. a couple of years ahead of me, and a guy I looked looked up to. And I always kind of, I was always very good at kind of like looking to the next level about what I wanted to achieve. You know, I remember seeing the the Irish international at waterproof jacket and golf yeah. bag and going, yeah, yeah. man, I'd love one of those one day, yeah. you know, and, you know, climbing the ranks and getting there. And then, you know, seeing the college golf bag with a logo on the side of it saying, you know, college golf in America, that's, that's what I want to do. And that, that was really the turning point for me, I guess, was college in the U S I, um, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, you, you, you really kicked on there, didn't you? I, mean, I did. You know, I, I, talk to me about where you were when you arrived and yeah. where you were when you left as a player. Yeah, I think that was a big change in my life. I mean, I think, you know, I, I wasn't good enough. I, you know, I wasn't sort of the, the, the very, very high level standout guy that got recruited by the best mm -hmm. schools in America. And I really don't think there was a lot of British and Irish recruitment at that point. It was really just starting to happen. Yeah. And I didn't have the money to go anywhere. And I wasn't recruited and I didn't have the know-how to get there. Ricky and a few of my friends went to Toledo. And eventually Toledo didn't have any scholarship money. So I couldn't, you know, they, they couldn't afford to bring me there. And so I ended up, you know, just kind of continuing my education. I went to Queens and Belfast for a year and I got the call halfway through the year from, from UAB. A guy called Chris Devlin, who was from Ballymena in Northern Ireland, ended up randomly in Birmingham, Alabama at UAB, gave the coach my number, called me, said, would you be interested in coming out and having a look? And I said, yeah, I'd be very interested. It's what I've always wanted to Why do. Yeah. It's what I've always wanted to do. I'd never been to the States before and, you know, ended up in Birmingham, Alabama, which, you know, obviously is a pretty historic city, you know. It's had a bit of an influence on your accent. To be it's careful. definitely <laughs> messed my accent up, to, you know, much to the amusement of your listeners, I imagine. Um, you know, I remember coming home after my first year and I had put on about 15 pounds and I, you know, had this crazy, crazy accent, you know, so... That, <laughs> it wasn't like a conscious decision, but I remember thinking to myself about a few months into my first year in, in, in Alabama, thinking, I'm going to spend the last rest of my life repeating myself or something's going to have to just maybe change a smidge yeah. here, you know. And, and yeah, I can sympathize. I lived over there for eight years in the Northeast in Connecticut, which is not, the accent there's not as extreme as yeah. where we're talking, you, where you were. So that the fact that you changed is far more likely than it was for me. You know? But then, but then I'll meet people in the U S that have lived there for 25 years and their accents thick as it yeah, was. Just off the boat. You yeah. just like, they're literally just off the boat. And I'm yeah. thinking to myself, what part of my brain yeah. made me take on this kind of, you know, mid Atlantic kind of, you know, like I say, humorous people think it's hilarious. And, you know, it's not something I really well, tried it's, it's to do. It's certainly distinctive. It's, I, yeah. yeah. So, you know, hopefully maybe in the next chapter of my life, maybe, you know, if I go into the <laughs> media ranks, you know, it, yeah. it might make me a few quid or, or not, you know. And so we'll, we'll see. But, you know, like I said, going back to that, that was a really a big changing, a, a huge turning point in my life because – if I'd ended up in Toledo, would I be sitting here today? Because my all my mates went to Toledo, hmm. and they never really kicked on. I'm not sure if it was weather or facilities or coaching or whatever. They never really kicked on. And for some reason, I just locked out where I ended up. Birmingham had amazing golf courses, amazing facilities. The golf coach wasn't really a coach, so he left our swings alone. So we just played, yeah. played a lot of golf. I remember standing in a bunker. It was the end of January, middle of my first year. I was in shorts. The sun was shining. I was practicing. I've thought to myself, I'm for the first time got a competitive advantage on, on the guys back in the UK and Ireland that I'm trying to beat. Yeah. I remember just having this, like having this kind of weird epiphany, you know, going, I'm, I'm, I'm one up here. Mm -hmm. And I went home that summer and I won everything gone from being a international player for Ireland, but yeah. not one of the best yeah. to having to having a standout summer where I pretty much won everything I teed it up in. 
got in the Walker Cup team, which was was which was special, and and that that kicked me on. That that elevated me to 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 the next level, and you know can, played well my final two years in college. I think I won three times my second year, and I won six times my last year. I only had three years of eligibility. Yeah, you were becoming almost dominant. At, I, I, you, left. you know, I was number one ranked player in Division One golf, and you know it was like okay. What do we do now? We turn pro, and I came back to Europe, obviously, because I had a higher profile back here. I could get some starts. The Irish Open, the European Open, at the K Club, Slaley Hall was actually my debut. Great North Open, and uh, Chubby, you know, Chubby was was managing me in those days. I, you know, and I, it's interesting the little decisions that kind of shape your life. You know, spent around time around Clark and Westwood, and these guys were international superstars who you know didn't just jump on planes to go to Japan to play golf tournaments. They jumped on planes to go to Japan to win golf tournaments, you know, and they were, they were winners. Yeah. And, and that was a good early influence for me in my, in, in my career was, you know, that you don't just show up, you, yeah. you win tournaments. Yeah. That's what you do. And, uh, so that helped me a lot in the beginning, you know, fly, fly business class, stay in nice hotels, eat steak <laughs> What's that like? and play good <laughs> and play good. You know, it was kind of like invest in yourself act like you're Lee yeah. Westwood mm-hmm. and, you know, before you even become that good, you know, so yeah, little things like that were important for me back in my young days. And, um, you know, I was lucky enough that I, that I won early, took all the fourth tournament, yeah. took, took all the kind of clawing yeah. sort of for, for air. The and whole world opens up. When you for sure. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. you know, <clears throat> golf's an amazing sport and, you know, we could talk for hours about, you know, why players make it, why certain players don't make it. You yeah. know, qualifying school, it's a yeah. lottery. Yeah. How many great players are out there? How many great players never had a chance to play in a major championship that could have won that are, that are, mm-hmm. yeah. that are more talented than the guys that are out there doing it week in, week out? I always think it's harder to get out there than it is to stay out there. Once you're out there, mm-hmm. if you're any good and you have any discipline, you yeah. know, it, you can make a great career out of it. But it's hard to get out there. Yeah. And uh, like I say, I was fortunate enough to come off a winning mentality in college. I remember I missed my I missed the cut at Slaley. I think I'm finished 35th at the Irish Open. Can't remember what I did at the K Club. Missed the qualifying for the Open Championship, and Chubby sent me to the Challenge Tour in Germany. And I remember sort of saying, I don't want to go to the Challenge Tour. <laughs> what was that like? Yeah, I remember yeah. it was a washed out <laughs> event in Germany that that Ian Pyman won, and I think I think I finished second to him. All right. But, you know, Chubby sent me out there kicking and screaming a little bit because ah, I want to play in the, you know, yeah. but I didn't have any starts coming. And yeah. it was, a you know, again, little small, you know, I went out there for a second in a, pro, in my, you know, a pro event and go, okay, okay, I remember how to do this again. It, it, it sometimes helps to see what you don't want. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. There's, There's no, no doubt. doubt. Yeah. Sometimes, like you say, a little sniff of the challenge to, okay, I don't want to be here. Exactly. It's also that little bit of a confidence boost where you kind of feel like you're good enough to compete. Yeah. You're good enough to win. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, we'll talk about sort of the live tour, I'm sure, as we go on here. But, like, it's nice to come to an event like here at Close House where I feel like, you know, if I play well, I can win. Yeah. I've always, scheduling has always been important in my career in that, you know, you need to bounce up and down levels. Because if you spend too much time at the top, Mm. you'll get chewed up if you're not playing well. Yeah. So it's nice to kind of drop down maybe a level or two, feel kind of good about yourself, compete get the kind of juices flowing a little bit and then take yourself back up again, you know? So it's really kind of sharpening and kind of, because, you know, like we talked about, there's so much men, men, mental, you know, the mental element of the sport, huge and confidence and belief and all these things. And you can't just well, pluck those out of the sky. Level you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, you, you just can't pluck this stuff out of the fine, sky. Fine margins. Isn't yeah. It? No yeah. doubt. And you, you can't find it in the range. You know, some psychologists can't talk it into you. Mm-hmm. You just have to, you have to be out there and you have to feel it and you have yeah. to know it inside that you're good enough to compete. It comes and goes just, it, 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 it's, it, it's crazy. That's, that's golf, isn't it? Yeah. You mentioned the Walker Cup there. I didn't want to bypass that. Um, what are your memories of 2001 at Sea Island? Because that was, that was quite a team and, yeah. you went, and you won, of course. Yeah, Peter McAvoy was the captain. Mm-hmm. I remember him. How, how did you get on with him? He's been a guest on this podcast. Yeah. I got on great with him, I, I think, uh, from memory. I mean, not, I, not everybody did. As yeah. I'm sure he would be the first to tell you. You know, it's funny. He did a really cool thing, and we actually did, used it in Paris at the last Ryder Cup when Harrington was captain. And it was it was a really cool thing because he got the team together the night or couple of nights before the tournament start, and he kind of made he made a big deal of presenting us all with the team sweater. It didn't matter what the, what it was. It, yeah. it, it was a sweater, but. 
you know, he called every player up individually and, you know, look, Donald, you've done this, 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 and this. You're, you know, you are a champion and yeah. that's why you're on this team. Graham McDowell, this is what you have, you know, he made everyone feel very special. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a really cool little piece of psychology because, you know, for, you know, so we're, we're in Paris and it's Harrington's Ryder Cup. And of course you got Rory McIlroy in the room. And you've got Bernd Wiesberger in the room. Uh, no disrespect. John to Rahm. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, you've got rookies yeah. and you've got the best yeah. absolute top of the tree guy, right? So the rookie's yeah. always going to feel inferior in that room. So I, I suggested it to Harrington that he, that he, that, you know, cause I thought it was just, it was just one of those things that stuck with me, you yeah. know, and I think yeah. it's just so important to kind of make, make a big deal about everyone and, on, and, and make them feel like they deserve to be in that room. So that was my, what was one of my memories from, from the Walker cup in 01 with a great team. It was hotter than hell. I, I, I'd never played in that type of heat before. Obviously, they were in Memphis at the FedEx last week, which kind of reminded me of what Sea Island was like in August. Um, I'd never, you know, coming from Ireland, and uh, obviously I'd played some college golf, but I'd never played in, in American summer heat before. It was 115, crazy hot. Because you'd be back here in the summer. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I'd always yeah. play my college golf. Yeah. I'd come home in June, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't go back out till sort of mid-August. mid, mid, yeah. mid -August. So... Michael Hoey and I played foursomes together. We won both our foursomes. And I played Bryce Mulder twice in the singles, and Bryce Mulder was best best amateur in the world at the time. Yeah. And he beat me on 17, and he beat me on 18 on Sunday. So, uh, you know, lost both my singles, which was disappointing. But it was a great time. I just remember a great team of lads, Stephen O'Hara, Mark Warren, Nick Doherty, Luke Donald. It was, it was great. You know, it was special to, you know, the Walker Cup. Yeah, team stuff's special. You know, they're my, they're my best memories. I don't, I don't have a lot of, like, I don't keep, I'm not a memorabilia guy. I don't keep a lot of things, you know. Obviously, you know, nice to have my trophies and whatever. And, and, and I have my golf bags. I have my Walker Cup bag and I have my Ryder Cup bags. And those are sort of my special, you know, those are special things to me because they're good memories. Have you got a room for all that stuff? Or is it, yeah. Is it, I keep my, my they're, 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 they're in the garage. Yeah, they're in the garage. Well, <laughs> it's a garage like inverted commons. Right. It's sort of like, you know, decked out. You know, I've got my clubs and I got, you know, just my storage areas and stuff. Right. And I've got some little cubbies for my, for my golf bags, sort of like little presentation cases, if you like, you know, my, my Walker Cup bag and my four Ryder Cup bags and the mm. couple of Ice Captain bags. They, the Ryder Cup, yeah. they sit down in the, yeah. the, down below. But, yeah. but um, no, I mean, like I say, they're the team experience that I've had in my career far outshine any individual experiences I've ever had. You know, I mean, the, well, Ryder, the Ryder Cup is hang on something hang super on special. We're, we're talking about somebody here who won the US Open at Pebble Beach. Are you telling me that that's below what you just talked about? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I think emotionally. Really? Emotionally, there's nothing quite like the team events and the Ryder Cup. I mean, yeah, that's uh, the greatest moments of my career. You know, I mean, I think I look at all four. Obviously, it's easy to focus in on Celtic Manor in 10 because I played the last match. But, yeah, there was something incredibly unenjoyable about that because, you know, you're shitting yourself, you know. And it's just very hard to kind of, you know, when people think, oh, that must have been amazing. No, no, it was really hard. You know, it was, you know, it was very, it was a very difficult, nerve-wracking moment in my life. But, of course, afterwards, you know, it's amazing. And you look back and you go, that was something special. It, it, you know, it was... You can't enjoy it. Though, it's, right? it's, it's not, a, in the moment, it's not enjoyable. Uh, you know, the, the four Ryder Cups, 2008, we got beaten Valhalla, but it was my rookie year. And I felt like I, you know, I won my singles and I won a match with Pulse, which was probably the best Ryder Cup match I've played maybe ever. We beat Furyk and Kenny Perry on Saturday afternoon. And it was a great game. You know, so eight was special, even though we lost. Ten was special for the obvious reasons. Twelve, Medina. It was a bittersweet one. I mean, it was an amazing weekend. Miracle but Medina. Remember, I lost I, my singles on Sunday. Which I remember, is, you weren't playing great. That, no. There's always somebody arrives not playing great. Yeah. Right? There's not much you can do about that, is there? Yeah, it was a funny weekend for me. I, yeah. I, I was only supposed to play Friday morning. They told me I was being sat down Friday afternoon. So Rory and I win our match on Friday morning against Snedeker and uh, Furyk. Got it up and down in the bunker at the last where he had a great trap shot at about six feet. I made it to win. And I remember having this like, huge relief thinking, you know, and then McGinley, I think it was McGinley was the vice captain. He told yeah. me I was going straight back out in the afternoon. And I was like, I, I remember coming out that afternoon so, went ready for so flat. Yeah. It was like mentally I'd nearly prepped that I wasn't playing. And then I just, I couldn't, f I, I, I was, I just remember being incredibly tired that weekend. I think I'd played a lot of golf. And I just couldn't muster up the energy to get myself playing good enough that afternoon. And 
sort of coupled with the fact that playing better ball with Rory and Rory sitting at 350 down the middle. And I remember going into one of these par fours about the seventh that hit eight iron in the morning off Rory's drive. And I'm going in with four iron in the afternoon thinking, geez, is this course a bit longer than I thought it was, you know, and, and I played badly that afternoon and it kind of knocked the stuffing out of me for the rest of the weekend. Rory and I got beat again in the morning in the foursomes by Snedeker and Furyk on the last again. Didn't play Saturday afternoon. And then Zach Johnson beat me on 17 on Sunday. But I mean, it was Miracle Medina. Right. Uh, you know, yeah. so yeah, don't I, be cared I, at that point. I, I got to do the opposite of Celtic Manor. I got to, you know, Celtic Manor, you're the guy on stage, everyone's watching. I got yeah. to kind of be like, okay, I lost my singles. Let's go support the boys. And, you know, I got to be able to, you know, watch my team yeah. and Martin Keimer get the job done, you know. And then 14 Glen Eagles was probably my favourite of all the Ryder Cups I've played. Well, because, you're in a specific role there. I yeah. Know, Paul had you playing with um, Victor yeah. Wissong months before. Yeah, it was, it was cool. It was, nice to, it was nice to sort of be mature enough and be experienced enough to be able to kind of think about somebody else for a change, taking Victor under my wing a little bit. He's a very different character, isn't he? Very different. And, yeah. and you know, Paul actually handled him extremely well that week, you know, because he's a guy who likes his space and he likes his mates around him and doesn't really like to kind of have to be here at a certain... He likes to, he's a bit of an enigma. He yeah. likes to do his own yeah, thing. Yeah. And Paul handled him incredibly well. Victor and I had a good relationship. He played stunningly well Ooh. in the two foursomes games that I played with him. And and like I say, I, I felt like I was able to kind of nearly focus on somebody else for the weekend. And it gave me like this sort of opportunity to be able to take it all in a little bit, which was amazing. And, you know, we won both our foursomes. And then I led Europe off on Sunday and beat Spieth. And, you know, obviously it was a pretty rampant victory that weekend. And that was, in a funny way, nearly my favorite of the four Ryder Cups. Mm. You know, it was obviously my last. But uh, like I said, they've all been very special for different reasons for me. And, uh, you know, they do. They overshadow a U.S. Open just because they're just more emotional. You know, you share experiences with guys. You create bonds. You... You just, it's its just something a bit different. A major uh, winning tournaments is very individual. Yeah. It's me, my coach, yeah. my caddy, my family, mm. the people close to me. That's it, you know. Mm. If I don't win, that's it. I'm letting them down yeah. and that's the end. If you, you know, the Ryder Cup is just something different, right? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're representing your continent. You're representing everything, you know, that is the European tour, yeah. that is your, your friends, your colleagues, your heroes, your peers, mm. everything, you know, it's a bit special. Tiff Tough Hybrid Bermuda means less work and more play. Tough by name and by nature, this turf variety supplied exclusively by Lawn Solutions Australia is the perfect choice for your home lawn. With superior drought tolerance, speedy recovery and toughness, Tiff Tough really is the smart grass. For more information and to find your nearest accredited supplier, head to lawnsolutionsaustralia.com.au. Uh, you mentioned 08 there. Um, I've always been quite impressed by the fact that you and your fellow teammates have have never really thrown your captain under the bus after that week because mm. he it was it, it was, was a pretty was, controversial week. Who was the captain there? It was um, Mr. Faldo. <laughs> yes. Um, so I'm, I'm, I've always been impressed by that. I'm not expecting you to do any different here, but um, th- that must have been a bit different. But you wouldn't know it was a bit different at that point. It was your first one, but. The, the European camaraderie thing, it maybe gets a wee bit overblown, but it's definitely a big part of it, isn't it? No doubt. I mean, I think, you know, every captain's different, you know, and I think it, you know, Faldo, oh, wait, Faldo was my hero in the 90s. Yeah. You know, he he was the guy I looked at and, you know, he was, he was, you know, had a few Pringle sweaters in the closet. <laughs> yeah. um, he was the man, you know, and it was obviously pretty special to play my first Ryder Cup under him. Um He's a certainly an interesting guy, uh, as I've gotten to know him over the years. And you know what? What makes a great Ryder Cup captain? I think that really you bit know of, a bit of luck becomes sure. for sure. It's yeah. like what makes a great coach or a great caddy, well, a great player. Yeah. What makes a great Ryder Cup captain a great team, hmm. right? But um, you know, obviously, it's like I look at Harrington in twenty. What was it? Twenty one Weston Strait or yeah. the last yeah. the last Ryder Cup? I mean, he, he did everything right hmm. and takes the historic beating. Hmm. Does that mean he's a bad captain? Yeah. No, I mean I was his vice captain. He was not a bad. He was a good captain. Yeah. He did a lot of great things. Right. So, winning captains are the heroes. 
or is, to, is the team just good, right? Yeah. I mean, I, mean I, I look back at that last one, and I've said this before. That I think on here, it's, it's it's such a fine line. I mean, if you on the Saturday night, you're you're six points behind. Rory has played poorly for him, and has lost three matches. Rory plays well and wins three. You're tied. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's that. Yeah. You know the, uh, the importance of the top players. I mean, the formula for winning is not difficult to figure out. If your mm-hmm. top three players all play well and win three and a half, four points out yeah. of five, you'll win. Correct. It's that simple. Yeah. And I mean, I think there's a lot of emphasis put on the captains, you know, obviously Watson and Glen Eagles. I mean, you know, Faldo and 08. Like, to me, there's there's no point throwing the captains under the bus because they have such a small such a small impact on what they can actually do for the weekend. Mm-hmm. They create the environment. Yeah. The, you know, in Europe, they obviously help set the course up to a certain extent. They, they create the, the, obviously the chemistry and the, the partnerships. But like at that point, like you say, it's down to the guys. They got to play good. They got to pull putts. Yeah. They got to, well, you can do it. Right. And, you know, yeah. you're playing me and I go out and I hold one more putt more than you. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to win. You yeah, know, as I say, I mean, Harrington was probably, that was probably the most involved that I'd been. Who was the vice captain? Uh, Thomas, though, the, in, uh, in Paris. Mm-hmm. You know, just, Paris was a perfect golf course, yeah. you know. It's just, you know, I'd imagine Rome is going to be a little similar, perhaps. You know, yeah. Paris was just a a golf course that we knew so well. Yeah. You know, played so many French Opens around there. I mean, it's a really unique golf course. And, I mean, I don't think the Americans were ready for that track, you know. I, and they- I had to laugh, and I've said this before. <laughs> I keep saying that. But um, I was glanced, when I was there, I glanced up at the top of the hill, and there was Jim Furyk, Matt Kutcher, Zach Johnson, and somebody else. And I remember thinking, they should all be playing on this golf course. Yeah, no, I remember, Far better than some of the guys who were playing. I remember standing on a tee with Kuchar thinking to myself, we'd probably do okay around this track here. You know, it'd be a decent game yeah. with us here. So, you know, I, I look at, you know, like I say, I was probably more involved in Harrington's team a little bit um, just because I became more immersed in just the way he did things. And, um, and like I say, he was he did a great job and took an absolute – beat down so oh, does that mean he's a bad guy does that mean it's tainted his legacy you know is he not a great champion is he not you know no okay. yes he is i mean he's absolutely you know one of the you know european tour you know one of ireland's greatest players three-time major champion great rider cup cap yeah he it, it, it lost but you know so i think there's a lot of emphasis put on on these captains and um was faldo bad no it's different i mean you know i didn't know any different so it didn't really bother me too much yeah. um i had a great weekend i had a great weekend and uh, of Though course I must, I must admit Graham, i have to say i was when he was making his speech at the opening ceremony i, I was back in my hotel watching it on television and i was lying on the bed and, and i actually had to get up off the bed <laughs> i was becoming physically uncomfortable yeah. Just, and I, I actually shouted at the television oh, no. hey, he make threw, him stop he make threw a couple stop. couple of irish jokes in there you know yeah. paddy got the potatoes in ireland and all that stuff and i got the what part of ireland i'm from then that, you know yeah. that's not a big deal at all which part of ireland you're from right yeah. you mean oh, no, no, there's, there's been no violence no yeah. bloodshed over that one at all has there yeah. so um yeah. no nah, i mean it was uh it was a little uncomfortable at times but you know that's Faldo's own kind of flavor of, of wit a little bit as well, you know, yeah. and he's made millions from it. So uh, who, who, yeah. who are we to argue? Fair enough. <laughs> um, before we get to Pebble Beach, um, I did want to ask you about the um, the team aspect of um, live golf. I mean, you, I, I'm with you. I think that given the way that we don't know what's going to happen, the way the jigsaw puzzle of world golf is at the moment, but I think, ironically, I think the team golf might be the thing that survives. I mean, how, how do you th- feel about that? <sighs> Uh, I mean, maybe like the IPL cricket, there'll yeah. be a month set aside for team golf. Who knows? I don't yeah. know. But. I mean, that, you know, the first season last last year when we played the sort of beta season, if you like, the eight events, I mean, that was the part that kind of blew me away the most was how compelling the team stuff was and how much guys were into it. I'm like, well, we're going to play for 20 million individually each week. Who, who's going to care about the 5 million yeah. team money? You know, yeah. And that's yeah. going to fade into ins- <laughs> insignificance. Yeah. But it was quite the opposite. Yeah. It, and, and it's the part I probably enjoy the most on live is it sort of breaks the monotony of, of, you know, the 25, 30 weeks on tour, just dragging it out by yourself. You know, there's something nice about practicing with a team, info sharing, pulling for each other, working for something bigger than just yourself, you know? And, uh, and that's why I think that the, you know, listen, live's got a long way to go from the franchise's point of view before, 
people around the world recognize the rippers and you know yeah. what is a clique you know and you know the, the majestics and there's a long way to go there before yeah. that that's a real that's thing but I, I i really do feel like the ingredients are there i think the players believe in it which is which is the most important thing that i think because the fan knows when they switch the tv on whether a guy's into it or not you know you, you can't fake it right and uh we're certainly not out there playing exhibition golf. I hate when I read that. You know, it's this exhibition match. It's, you know, it's not. Guys are working really hard. There's a lot of money on the line. There's a lot of stuff to play for. Mm -hmm. And these guys are competitive and they care, I, right? I don't question that for a second. But the, the hardest thing, if, I, if I'm typical, I mean, I'm, the, I'm Mr. Golf fan at the moment. The hardest hurdle, the biggest hurdle that you guys have got is getting me to care mm -hmm. about who wins. Yeah, for sure. No doubt. And I, and I think... The FedEx Cup has the same problem, mm -hmm. and I think yeah, a lot of I don't the care about that either. No, no. Uh, you know, I uh, and there's no doubt about yeah. that. I totally agree with you. The four majors will always be the four majors, and they will be the most special golf tournaments on planet Earth, and the Ryder Cup and the Presidents Cup. They're the most special tournaments on planet Earth, right? So everything else has to fight for oxygen below that, and you've got to create platforms that are compelling for the fan. And I do think the team thing. There's something there, definitely, because it's so divorced from from the majors. Yeah. If any, anybody coming into golf, like live golf, have done. I mean, if they're smart, they, they won't even consider getting in the way of the majors. Mm -hmm. Just let them be. You yeah. Know? No. No. And 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 they should be yeah. right. And then it goes back to the whole seventy two fifty four debate, right? I mean, I, I just think that. Golf doesn't always have to be 72 holes. It doesn't always have to be stroke play. Yeah. It doesn't have to be traditional, you know. I don't want the same of anything every week. No, I think yeah. the fan wants something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But it has to be real. Like you said, you have to you have to care, all right? And, and I mean, that's why the franchise thing's interesting. If, mm -hmm. if there's a team representing every country in the world, you know, the Australians, the Koreans, the Japanese, the English, the Irish, the Americans, the South American, all of a sudden you start to kind of get that's, that little partisan. That would be a smart way to break it down yeah. to start with. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I think they had, they'd love to get there, but obviously, you know, it, there's a lot of hurdles. That, there's a lot of countries that, you know, that need to be represented. There's a lot of, there's a lot of countries that don't want to be involved. And, it, you know, the, we all know the negativity and the, and the hurdles that, are, that, that exist at the minute. But um, there is something there. How does it plug into the big puzzle of the world of golf, right? So you got the majors, you got the PGA Tour, you got the European Tour, the Asian Tour, the Live Tour. You've got all these little puzzle pieces that need to fit in. End of the day, it really comes down to what John Ram and Brooks Kopka and Rory McIlroy and Bryson DeChambeau and Dustin Johnson. It really comes down to what they want to do, what they want to play in, how many events is too much. You got the four majors. How many live events does Roy McIlroy want to play? If we got to that point, right? Doesn't sound like many at the moment. To be does honest. it? And I mean, you know, how many PJ <laughs> Tour events does Brooke Kopka want to play? Maybe yeah. not very many, yeah. right? So it's like um, there's there's a lot of stuff. There's you know there's questions that need answered. Yeah. Will this merger even happen? You know, who knows? At, at least at least we've laid down our weapons. The game of golf. You know, we, we, we can be friends and we can all operate inside of the same ecosystem. Maybe there's not going to be, there's not maybe going to be some sort of overlapping schedule. There's not going to be guys jumping back and forth. Maybe well, they just continue down their paths. Hopefully they're all talking about that right now. Yeah, that, for sure. And, and, you know, the powers that be will figure that out. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll come up with something potentially tangible and they got to go sit down with the best players in the world and say, can you do this? And if they can Brilliant. You know, I think the golf fan will win because, really? yeah. you know, if you get, you know, the best players in the world playing against each other more often and something they give a shit about, then you're off to the races. Well, I've talked about this before and I've written about this as well, that the getting the best players in the world playing against each other more often is fine up to a point. Mm -hmm. But again, you get into the sameness thing. Yeah, I don't. I, for sure. Yeah, there's a, I, I would like to think that the top guys will split up to a certain extent three or four times a year and they'll all go off yeah. and play somewhere that's going to make a difference. And my mind always goes back to Rory McIlroy played in the South African Open mm -hmm. three or four years ago as a favour to Ernie. The place was moving yeah. with people yeah, because he was there. I think they're so important, these guys. And I think they could, I would argue that they could do more. Yeah. They could go once a year. If everybody went once a year, top 10 in the world went somewhere mm -hmm. once a year for nothing just because it was the right thing to do, yeah. the, the, it would all be better. Yeah. There's no doubt. I, I agree with what you're saying there completely. You, you, you know, we're all about this F1 model, right? You know, where you know who's showing up every week. 
that's yeah. that's cool because yeah. the sponsor knows there's what he's getting. Every week. I know it, there's a sameishness to the, it. That's right? what's same. I want to get away from that. And I alluded to it at the start of our conversation. You know, I. I'm very happy where I'm playing. I think lives lives a fun product. I like the team stuff. I like our schedule. I like playing a bit less, but I also don't like the sameishness of it. You know, it's it's a very high standard yeah. because you're playing against Brooks Cup, yeah. Cam Smith, mm-hmm. Dustin Johnson, Bryson every week, mm-hmm. and if you don't get going in the 54 hole format, mm-hmm. it's a sprint. If you don't get off to a start, you know, you're finishing 30th and that sure. doesn't feel good. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's something, you know, I, I need to supplement my schedule with some, some golf. That's why I'm here, you know, at close house this week. I need other golf to be able to maybe drop down a, I don't want to, you know, we're, we're dropping down a level from, you know, we're, you know, if, the, if it was a world ranking point versus world ranking points, this is a level below, you know, live. Mm-hmm coming here knowing that if I play good golf that I have a chance to win a tournament All right so and I need that and I've always needed that in my career and I've always needed that for my for my general mental state because you know if I'm finishing 25th 30th every week and live that's not making me feel good about myself and I need to feel good be otherwise you know it becomes a very difficult game it, it, the physical side I can do it it's the mental side that I can't do if I don't believe in myself and I don't have confidence. Yeah. So um, I'm excited to come here this week. I've actually got three or four more Asian tour events that I'll play between now and the end of the year. I'd love an opportunity Are you to play next week in Scotland. I'm not actually, my, you know, I, I would have played my little brother's in going to be in Florida with his kids. And I wanted to get back and see him for four or five days before he go, flies back to Ireland. So um, otherwise I would have went up there. Would have, it would have been fun. I'm off the back of two. So that would be four in a row. Yeah. I try not to get away from the kids for more than three max if I if I can. So, um, but yeah, I'll play Singapore and Hong Kong and Indonesia at the end of the year. I mean, listen, I need to supplement my schedule with something. Yeah. If it's not the PGA Tour and it's not the DP World it's Tour, gonna well, Tour. it's going to be the Asian Tour. So, I, 14's not enough for me. 30's too many, and 14's not enough. It's about 22 is probably my number, you know. And uh, I'm I'm getting a bit older. I just turned 44. But, you know, like we said, I still love it. I still love competing. I still have some things I want to do. I want to win a live event. I'd like to get back in the majors, play a few more major championships. There's things I want to achieve in the sport. Yep. You played 54 so far. 54 majors? Yep. Jeez. Only five top tens. Yeah, not very good. Yeah. Anyway. Not very good. Um, I was going to ask you, um, on the subject I've lived before we get to Pebble Beach, which we will do, run me through your decision-making process at the beginning of that. Uh, go on, yeah, sort of. You know, May, June last year, getting ready for the, yeah, I mean. Whether to do it or not. Yeah, I mean, to, to should I stay or should I go? Yeah. Um, I made a lot of phone calls, spoke to people in the game that I trusted, spoke to my sponsors, spoke to my family, of course. You know, weighed up, weighed the risk-reward elements. Uh, being honest, the, the financial reward was just about enough to kind of move yeah. the needle for me. In your time of life as well. In my time of good. life, I'm not going to tell you they paid me $100 because they didn't, no. you know. <laughs> they paid me enough to make the decision worthwhile in the space that I was in in the sport. I'd, I'd tasted the top 20 in the world and the top 10 in the world, and I'd been paid as a top 10, top 20 player in the world for four or five years, but I was off. I was coming down the other side of that well, crest. You're at, and, that, you're at that age. I mean, there's no shame to, to mid, mid-40s. Yeah. It's when typically... There's a yeah, dip. you know, I, I was I was dipping, and uh, you know, in a funny way, the pandemic knocked the life out of me. You know, I went into the pandemic just off the back of winning the Saudi International, ironically. Um, you know, when it was a European yeah. tour, co-sanctioned with Asian tour, won that. Just shot sixty-eight in the first round of the players, coming off the back of a top five in Hawaii. So I mean, I was I was starting to get we had a steam up again, you know, and I was excited. And then the world shut down. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know what happened to me. I spent the three months training. I was biking and I was in a decent shape and came back out to play all fired up and something clicked in my head. I just wasn't sure if it was just no fans or just this new world. It was and certainly different. There was, it, there was an eeriness to what we were I, doing. Having said that, from a journalist's point of view, Graham, it was brilliant. Yeah. We got access to players like you'd never believe that's before. crazy yeah <laughs> but it, it it knocked absolute stuffing out of me and i proceeded to have the worst 18 months of my career yeah. uh, missed so many cuts and went down the rabbit hole again got a new coach and tried to reinvent myself and not that i hurt myself i had multiple tears in my forearm just weird stuff happened to me you know and and then you know so that's 
and the 20 and the 21, 22 was, a, was turning out to be a grind again, you know, and then here comes Liv, you know, and obviously through my relationship with winning the Saudi International, you know, I, I'd sparked up a relationship with Saudi Golf, uh, Golf Saudi, and, uh, you know, I liked the guys. I, I, you know, I felt like they were into the game. I felt like, obviously, we spent a lot of time in the Middle East in our in our days, the last 20 years in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Qatar, and I just, it was another Middle East golf opportunity a lot of money yeah it seems to me though that the, the whole business the, the decision making process for everybody involved in this was you have to separate business from moral the aspect the moral aspect of the argument and and businesses the world over seem to manage quite nicely to be yeah. able to do that and, mm-hmm. and golf the, the only bad thing i feel why golf was getting singled out quite as much yeah as you know, it, you were just basically following the same path as everybody else. There's a lot of sports involved in Saudi Arabia. Certainly, every multinational business. Yeah, I mean, I went to the first um, the tournament in Saudi eighteen months ago, mm-hmm. and the place I was staying was a you know, strange, but I could walk to the Burger King, and you know, mm-hmm. the, all these people they were all there. Yeah, you know, so why? I mean, I'm, the moral aspect of it is you know nobody's going to win that argument for sure, but. Everybody's there. So why golf got singled out? Yeah, I don't know. I I mean, you'd know the answer to that question better than I than I would. Was it a strategic, planted narrative paid for by the PGA Tour? I I don't know. I mean, I'm totally speculating when I say that. But um, you know, you and I spoke about this when we were walking in here. You know, going back to Centurion and the first press conference, and I, I, I was not a paid ambassador for. Saudi Arabia human rights. Mm-hmm. I was a paid ambassador for a golf tour. Yeah. And well, I that was, was your mistake. When correct. You talking. I correct. Said, and, 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 and we're talking about that. I mean, that was the advice I you said. For sure. Well, what did I do wrong? I said, well, you got to a point where you didn't really know what you're talking about. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I went, you, you start answering questions that don't yeah. even need, a, they, they yeah. can't be answered. No. That's right. You know, so, and that was obviously, I, I, I regret those answers not that they were necessarily wrong that's what we'd been prepped to say yeah. by this golf tour that's paying me i'm not being paid by the saudi arabian you know like i say like this human rights organization or yeah. mm-hmm. i'm being paid by this new startup golf tour which is a financially lucrative opportunity for me at this stage of my career the end i mean you know i you know, people said, well, if he'd have just said it was about the money. Well, of course it was about the money. Everybody of course knows. it was, right? So, you <laughs> know, know that. you know, we absolutely, I mean, that was like the great, you didn't need to say it. Of course, yeah. that's what I was there for. Yeah. Right? It was a business And it decision. made perfect sense, as you know, your time of life. And Lee Westwood and Ian Poulter, again, perfect. I mean, of course they're going to do it at that time. They're not going to be winning consistently at the top level anymore. They're at that age where it doesn't happen. Yeah, no, and I mean, you know, certainly feel like my skin's thickened up a lot the last 16 months and I, I didn't handle it very well the, the, the summer the first three four months you know it bothered me it bothered me that I, a reputation that I'd spent 20 years building had actually just burned overnight you know and I'm like well is it really that fickle is it really that is that yeah I've, yes it is is the answer right public opinion will absolutely turn on you in a second right so why do I care about that so much if if it's that fickle you know, because I know that I've been a good pro yeah. all my career and I make a decision to go to a startup golf tour. And now I'm a bad guy. No, I, I, you know, I know that I behave like a pro and I act like a pro and I always have, you know. So what someone tells me on Twitter that they think of me, you know, I got to choose whether I, you know, what I, how I'm going to react to that, yeah. you know. And, yeah. and like I say in the beginning, when I, you know, when I first went to live, I didn't handle it very well because I'd never really been criticized much in my career. And I'd never, like I said, I, I, all I've, all I ever try to do is be a good pro. And obviously, you know, we talked about that press conference. I mean, it was an absolute minefield of disaster questions, well, you know. The tabloid that, journalist went after you. Yeah, for sure. And it was, uh, you were an easy target. Yeah, for sure. And like I say, I talk too much and that's the problem. And like I said, it wasn't like I said anything necessarily incorrect. I was trying to be an ambassador for, for a new tour. I wasn't trying to change the yeah, world. You went down a track that you, you just... For sure. Yeah. And I mean, like I say, totally regret it. But, uh, you know, I've never been the Dustin Johnson. I've never been the I don't care man. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I, that's not who I am. You know, I, I, I try to do my best. I try to articulate what I feel best I can. Sometimes, you know, 
you say too much. You know, it's like well, you're, you're far from alone. I mean, I mean, I see in here Lee Westwood, being the, the one we talk about here, that that gets so much grief for over going to live and the European tour. I mean, his relationship with them has deteriorated hugely. But I've got some sympathy for him more than some others because at the level Lee was at, which was right at the top, he supported the European tour. Yeah more than anybody else did at that level. I mean, Ian Poulter, Justin Rose, Sergio... Myself. Didn't play, didn't play nearly as often as he did. For sure. So I I've agree. got a wee bit more sympathy for him. Totally yeah. agree. And I, and I mean, it's probably the reason why I haven't got involved with the DP world politics as much, because I just don't feel like I deserve a voice as well, much. Well, you're not going to win that argument either. I, so, I, I mean, Lee Westwood mm-hmm. deserves a voice. He is a stalwart, mm-hmm. absolute European tour legend that has stood by them through thick and thin. And, um, you know, he's been treated the same way as the rest of us. And I, and, I, and I don't think deservingly so, because, you know, like I said, I headed off to greener pastures. I've chased the dollar. I went, you know, well, you know, my wife's American. I live in America. Yeah. I've got kids in America. So, I mean, you know, that was my life. But I went to America because it was a financially lucrative opportunity for me, you know, like going to live. Yeah. It was about the money and I was chasing greener pastures and better opportunities, you know. So, you know, I turned my back on the DP World Tour you know, I came back and I cherry picked, you know, like all the, yeah. all the things that they don't want us to do. Now, yeah, we, yeah, we don't want these guys coming back, cherry picking the best events. Well, that's what they've always done. It's what John Ram does, what yeah. Roy McIlroy does. We've always done it. We played America. Yeah. And when there's, you know, the, the European tour will piece the schedule around so that there's opportunities for the best players in the world to come back and cherry pick, play for a lot of money and get paid. That's how golf's always been, and it continues. Yeah, listen, I'm disappointed. You know that that we, are, you know, I'd I'd love an opportunity to support PGA Tour events that that I love. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't really have any exemptions left in America. I have some exemptions left in Europe. I'd love to come back and support the European well, that, Tour that events. Could I'd love to come back and support mm-hmm. the Irish Open and the Scottish mm-hmm. Open mm-hmm. and the events that I love. You know, so I'm hope I'm hoping hopeful that opportunity may arise someday. People will be listening and they'll say, well, you, you walked away from that. You don't deserve it. No, I understand I walked away from that. You know, I didn't want the game to be fractured the way it was. And I and I understand, and I I knew that that was a risk going back to the decision-making process. I, I knew what I was walking away from. Yeah, but if the European Tour is smart and, and to, looking at it purely in a business sense again, they'll want you guys to come back because you're, you're a draw. I mean, I'd, I'd come and watch you guys far more than some young guys that I've never heard of. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sure. Yeah, no, there's no doubt. Feel- I mean, listen, you tell me if Lee Westwood shows up at the Senior British Open a few weeks ago, he doesn't draw, in the, uh, you know, ten or 20,000 people to come watch him. Yeah. You know, if he goes to Wentworth, you tell me that Lee Westwood doesn't draw a crowd to Wentworth? Mm. It's kind of cutting your nose off to spite your face. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I, I get it, though. You know, the DP World Tour have to – they've got their strategic alliance with the PGA Tour. They feel like that's the best path for them. They had their opportunity with Saudi – uh, Saudi Arabia and kind of you know what they wanted to do for the European tour. You know, at the end of the day, the European tour brought these guys to the table. You know, they they, they made their bed with the PGA tour and and listen. I, I hope the tour the tour thrives because all I care about are the players out there. They are my friends. Mm. I want them to thrive. I want them to have great events to play in. Would I like to have an opportunity to play sometime down the road? Of course, I would love to love to support the sponsors, support the tour that kind of made me who I am. You know, I think. You know, yes, Poulter, Garcia, Rose, myself, all those guys that kind of, you know, chased the dollar and went to America. I think if you ask them where their heart lies, I think their heart probably still lies on the European tour. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. we, we care more deeply about yeah. that because it's our roots and it's our heroes and it's mm-hmm. the, you know, our heroes built that tour and the PGA tour to a certain extent is a little bit more soulless for us yeah. because we're not Americans, you know? So, you know, there's, there's no doubt there's a lot of guys that still love, you know, and care deeply about you know, the European tour and, and, and the direction that it's going. Enough of this. Pebble Beach, win the US Open. I mean, if you're going to win the US Open, that's the place to win it, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you must look back on that. I, I was still amazed by what you said earlier that, you know, the Ryder Cup means to your each to their own but if I'd been if I'd won the US Open at Pebble Beach I'd be yeah. I'd be telling everybody there's nothing better than that you know? yeah I mean it was a good time no doubt it was a good time I mean you know it was it's one of those it was a surreal week you know I just won in I won the Welsh Open two weeks previous at Celtic Manor played probably some of the best golf I've ever played that weekend at Celtic Manor I was like well before you go any further I, I do feel I'm, I'm always been a little bit miffed that you know my contribution to your winning at the US Open 
hasn't really been recognised okay. here, Graham. I mean, I have to explain that one. We, to you and I played together in the pro am at Wentworth oh, did three we? weeks before, ah. when the, the new Wentworth appeared, and you know, obviously seeing my game up close, yeah. was, would give you a real boost, I'm sure. Was that was that the first redo of Wentworth? Yeah, remember yeah, how bad it was. I remember you that got week. yourself into trouble. I got myself in because I played with yourself and a couple of other uh, the Reeson media guys, the and Tower. I did a I did a hole by hole of the changes, which Mr. Ellis took particular offense to for some reason, <laughs> even though I wasn't trying to be offensive. I no. was literally just giving, yeah. you know, my take on kind of what the changes were. Mm -hmm. And obviously there was a lot of criticism of the course that week. And uh, Ernie took it very personally and was actually wanting to scrap on the range the next yeah. morning. Yeah. And uh, you, you won't remember this, but uh, <laughs> I remember we walked off the 18th green. It wasn't, we'd started somewhere else. So it wasn't our last hole, but we played the 18th hole as it was then it's changed a little bit since yeah and i remember saying to you you know what a terrible hole that is graham and you went well, what do you mean i says well you're graham mcdowell and i'm me and you and i had just played the hole in exactly the same way uh -huh. three with six yeah 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 bench. yeah i should not be playing the hole the same way that you play it see it was your fault you got me in trouble there you obviously <laughs> planted that seed in my mind um that you know actually you know wentworth they actually do have the course right now. Yeah, I mean, it took it took them a few goes, and obviously, it wasn't just on Ernie. I think no. the, the the GM or the owner at the time was having a little bit of an architectural influence yeah. that he maybe shouldn't have been having, um, you know. And obviously, Ernie ended up sort of it was his name on it, and he got the flack a little bit. And guys were making sixes and sevens yeah. on that rebound. And by the way, you don't want to mess with Ernie. No, no, Ernie is a big if, lad. If that it you comes to a fight, I'm yeah, betting yeah. on him. I'm I'm running fast, but uh, no. Uh, so so when the wells open at Celtic yeah. Manor, play unbelievable on the weekend. Go back to f Orlando, f have four or five days at home there. I think I played nine holes with Ricky Elliott. I think I made like seven birdies in nine holes, just messing around with the lads. So, I, mean, I was I was playing really, I was playing really really well, and flew out to Pebble. And Pete Cowan tells me that I looked him in the eye that week and told him that I had a big one in me. I don't actually remember saying it, but right. you know, yeah, Pete, Pete Pete's, you know, Pete's really kind of got a mind for that stuff. But I, my, I, I don't think I was ready. I don't, I didn't think it was going to be that week, but there was something inside of me that was starting to brew, you know, and the U S open was, had been my most successful major to that point. You know, I, I'd, I'd, I'd made some cuts at the U S open. I'd competed a few times and there was something in me that felt like I was a U.S. open player. And, uh, obviously Pebble was, it was, a, was a surreal week. I played with Sean McKeel and Rocco Media the first two rounds. Played late on Thursday. Don't even remember what I shot. Don't even remember the round very well on Thursday afternoon, Friday morning. I remember I played well. I think I had a two or three shot lead that I slept on for, you know, probably 27 hours. You know, it was interesting watching the open there and Brian Harmon and the late tee yeah. times. And it kind of just brought me back a little bit, you know, a guy that's never really led a major before. Let it from Friday morning all the way into Saturday afternoon. And I remember Saturday afternoon, teed off about 3.50 local time, played with Dustin Johnson, first time I'd played with him. And I mean, he shoot 66 on a firm, windy pebble, US Open pebble. And I walked off and I went, holy shit, who's, who, who's this kid? Yeah. You know, I mean, it was just like, I just saw the next superstar. And I mean, obviously he turned out he was yeah. pretty good. And I remember Saturday was an incredibly nerve wracking day for me. Because I slept on that lead, and then and then all of a sudden I'd watch this absolute machine shoot, you know, shoot what he shot, and I thought to myself, "Well, we're playing for second tomorrow. The pressure's off, you know." And I remember, I remember coming out. You know, Saturday was a much more comfortable evening for me, and I came out Sunday feeling a little bit better about myself, just confidence wise, because I felt like all eyes were on Dustin. I remember Kenny saying something to me on the range that morning, you know, because, you know, obviously I was still nervous. So just relative well, to the Saturday, I wasn't yeah, as nervous. I can't believe you dismissed your chances completely. Yeah, no, no, no. I, of course, I was still <laughs> out there extremely competitive. I remember Kenny yeah. sending me, Tiger was a group in front. I think Phil was a couple of groups in front of Tiger. Ernie and, he, up there and Ernie was yeah. a couple of groups. I think he was a group in front of Tiger. So, I mean, you had three or four legends, you know, a few groups in front. And Kenny said to me, listen, you're going to probably hear some noise out there today. So just if you hear it, just know one thing. It's most likely a par putt. There's not going to be a lot of birdies out here. I mean, this place yeah. is so hard. Did that suit you, your game? It did. It, yeah. it suited me yeah. well. Yeah. It, you know, I, you know I'm you know, i more of definitely more of a chess player than a, than a checkers. Pebble that week was definitely chess. You know, I mean, we were hitting, you know, just, just for, you know, the par five, the sixth, we're hitting hybrid off the tee there. It was like, it was like yeah. an iron. It yeah. was literally like a race track. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. And, you know, it was very positional. It played very short. 
you had to be very conservative through iron play, playing to the front half of the greens, putting out to them. I put it great. You know, I think I was very good from inside 10 feet that week. Imagine your long putting would be good that way yeah, too. Yeah, you had to pace putt yeah. well, even though the greens aren't particularly big at mm-hmm. Pebble, obviously. But, um, you know, you had to hold a lot of five, six, seven yeah. footers. And I, and I did that really, really well that weekend. And, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously Dustin makes, what do you make, eight in the second and then doubles a third and ugly stuff, ends up shooting 81 or something yeah. on yeah. Sunday. So, I mean, I stood, stood in the third green and then it was all back on me again. Yeah. I'm leading the Open again, the U.S. Open. Played great for about eight holes, bogey nine, bogey ten from the middle of fairway. Kind of thought, holy shit, I'm letting this thing go here. Looked up at the leaderboard, Tigers two over for the day, you know, Ernie's, you know, I'm like, well, I still had a two shot lead. I'm like, yeah. all right. Yeah. And that kind of refocused me. It was my first time looking at the leaderboard that day. Really focused me. It dialed me back in again, part 11, got it up and down from the front bunker on 12, part 13. And 14 was kind of a weird one. I remember the par five, Doug, like right. I actually had a really good tee shot, but it's caught the last bunker right in the corner. Could only hack it out. Left myself a seven iron into the green. And I hit the seven iron to 14. It's a and terrible I, green, that way. Terrible. <laughs> and I, I mean, you know, the green ended up saving me in the end, but I hit the seven iron in and it was it was a top shelf seven iron for me. And I remember hitting it going, Jesus, that was pretty good under the circumstances here. You know, reason me nervous back nine on Sunday at Major and you just hit that shot. Okay. But it actually hit and ran over the back. I putted it up the slope and I hit it a little hard. So it went past and it started heading off into that right half of that green where balls had been coming right off the yeah. front. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, my ball, I'd say a couple more revolutions and it might went off the front. But it hung on. Mm-hmm. I made bogey. But I, I mean, that was huge because I could have made a number there. Yeah. I yeah. could have, I, you know, I could have. people did. did. Guys were making numbers yeah. there. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I remember hitting two great shots into the next. It's about 20 feet. Thought I made it. Actually, I walked it in. It lipped out. Par, great two-pot on 16 from long range. And then one shot lead stand on 17. And I started to probably get pretty nervous at that point. I, remember I, pretty, <laughs> much, I pretty much laid the sod over the five iron on 17. Right. 17 was unplayable. Yeah. It was downwind. The green's ridiculous. I'm it was sorry. downwind and it was to the left pin. And I knew if I flew this five iron on the green that I might not be able to hold the green. And over the back was dead. Yeah. So you were kind of like basically trying to pitch it just over the front bunker. And if it went in the front bunker, it was an okay leave. I think I one hopped into the bunker. I hit, I hit it so badly. I, you know, I, so I ended up in the front bunker, which yeah. was an okay leave. And yeah. I, I think I had an average trap shot. I missed about an eight footer. So I made bogey there and Havre had just made bogey in front. So it's Havre and Tiger in yeah. front and well, like, you, you know. You've given away the great trivia question. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Who was second? Who was second? Yeah. It was a funny story in that here in a second. But um, yeah, so, ha- so Havre and Tiger are the group in front and Havre ends up being the guy that comes close. So he bogeyed 17 as well. So then, so I know I've got a one shot lead playing 18, but 18 was playing short. They had the tee forward. Two trees in the middle of fairway. We all know Pebble, famous left side, no good. A couple of trees in the middle of fairway. And my game plan that week was if the tee was in the back, the trees were in a really bad spot for me because I couldn't get past them. So I was laying back and playing it as a three-shotter if it was on the back tee. Yeah. But they pushed it forward. And my game plan from the forward tee was we're going we're going past the trees. So there was no layup. There was no let's try and play five to win here. It was like, you know, I'm, I'm hitting driver. I hit a pretty good one. And I was in the right semi, about 230 flag, I think. And I could see Havre up. And he was in, he's, he's hit it in the right bunker in two. So it was kind of, you know, it was getting dusky, you know, and I could just, you know, I, I, I saw him hit a strap shot and couldn't really see the ball or listen for the crowd. We're like, is it, yeah, they're, they're, they like it, but I'm not sure they love it. Mm. And obviously it was about eight feet, 10 feet, and, and he missed it. And at that point, you know, it's five to win from 230 yards. Kenny wanted me to go for it. Him and I still argue about this to this day. <laughs> he wanted me to just bunt a hybrid up beside the green somewhere. Yeah. And I, I did not like the shot at all. All I could see was trouble. All I could see was left bunker, the tree that sits just short yeah. right of the green. If you mm-hmm. squirt one, you don't leave yourself a chip. I didn't want to go. He ended up letting me lay it up. But he, he argues to this day that uh, it was the other way around, that I wanted to go. Yeah. But uh, I, Ironically, given what we talked about earlier, I think the, the 18th at Pebble is actually a better hole. When you guys can reach it, into yeah, no, it's certainly it's, more interesting, it's and more a, fun to watch. It's a great hole because it's a hundred yard par three. Otherwise, yes, yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. that's the problem. You get par fives that, you know, we played one in Bedminster last week, the 18th hole, and I mean, it's a 
wonderful two shotter and it's a horrendous three shotter you know and like you say it ends up just being a part three guys all led up to the same spot and going well, wedge nine iron so you know i love 18 at pebble i think it's you know it's an, an iconic finishing hole and you know i laid it up to my favorite number which is 100 yards and hit a pretty good little wedge shot in there <laughs> i remember having 25 feet two putts to win and i remember like i'd you know gregory Havery. i mean I did no disrespect to him but i remember thinking to myself over the putt at least if I three putt this, I'm in a playoff, and I think I can handle Gregor tomorrow. <laughs> but you're right. But it was one of those weird yeah, yeah, thoughts that yeah. popped into my head, and yeah. I kind of took the pressure off me. It was yeah. weird, you know. And I wiggled it down there at about 16 inches, 18 inches, and you know, my my, my dad always said that he, he the back of the green sits just a little lower, and he couldn't right. quite see up over the top, and yeah. he saw Kenny starting to unscrew the flag, so he knew mm. it was pretty close. Yeah. yeah. But like I say, that was a weird thought. Yeah, no, listen, Gregory's a good friend, and yeah. But I just remember thinking, well, I think I can maybe win the playoff tomorrow. Yeah. I have one last question for you, Graham, before yeah. we wind this up. What happened to the cardigans? The cardigans. You're not wearing a cardigan today. What's going on? Yeah, the cardigans. Um, where did these come? From? Where did that start? Where did that start? I, I, I was buying. I was buying golf shirts from Gabici, Italian company, okay. and. Uh, I started getting a few bits of knitwear from them. I've always been a fan of, you know, I mentioned the Pringle sweater, yeah. sweaters early in the, in yeah. the, early in the chat. And I've always been a fan of fine knitwear. Yeah. And they started sending me these cardigans and, right. and I started wearing them and obviously got a bit, decent bit of feedback on them. And I was a wee bit slimmer in those days. And I think I could pull it off a bit better, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was definitely an interesting look that weekend. And obviously, yeah. Some you know Peb Pebble Beach in, in in June with a you know bit of ocean breeze can be a bit chilly you know so it was definitely a cardigan kind of day yeah. on that Sunday afternoon and yeah. it definitely added to the uh, added to the vibe a little bit shall we say but uh, no I don't actually not even sure I physically own a cardigan I do actually I do have oh, a, don't tell I, me I, that. Have, I have a few I have, oh. that's lies yeah. actually yeah. Yeah. I do have a few but uh, it's been a long time since I wore one of the golf course I got to be honest with you yeah well I miss them for what it's worth I'll bring them back yeah I'm gonna try and shed a bit of timber and bring them back yeah anyway Graham um, thank you for your time it's been uh, a fascinating chat hope you've enjoyed it as well yeah it's as been much great as no, I appreciate it John good to see you man thanks I reckon Huggy got it right in the intro there, an extremely engaging and interesting talker and thinker on the game. Big thanks to Graham McDowell for taking the time to sit down and chat. Well, as mentioned at the start, it is the run-up to the Ryder Cup, and next week it's a special episode and special guest when Huggy sits down with eight-time player and three-time European Ryder Cup captain Bernard Gallagher. Yeah, tell, tell me what the but, vice captain does. Well, exactly. Tell me what do I do because I, I wasn't privy to what went on in the team room like it is today. Being, you, were, you weren't in the team room? No, no, absolutely not. And, uh, well, I never saw that as my position. Tony called me a vice captain when he came to the end of his captaincy. But I never really felt I was anything more than a helper driving his buggy. That's next time on The Thing About Golf. Golf.